afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. We have about an hour and a half to go before cocktails and, and, and food. So I think, uh, I hope everyone is, is up to staying awake. And I'm sure we, we've got just a session to do that. Um, before I um, introduce our panelists and, and, and our session, I, I'd like to just go through a couple of brief housekeeping notes. Sorry about that. First of all, after this session, as I indicated, we're going to the gala dinner. There's going to be coaches leaving from outside the hotel, uh, more or less straight, after, straight afterwards. So if you need to run to your room quickly, you can do that, but then be prepared to board the coaches. Um, to where we're going to is a really beautiful venue uh, at Koningswinter. Um, and we've got a, a beautiful evening here, so, so really don't miss that. And let I me mean, remind you again, we've got a keynote speaker, um, Chris Bangle, who was the, used to be the head of design for BMW, still does a lot of work in the in design industry. So it's a bit of an outside logistics perspective um, and, and always and often quite provocative. So uh, not something you, you'll want to miss. There's a slide up here which is reminding you about the live, Automotive Logistics Live, uh, which is sponsored by, by Sovereign this year. Um, this session, we're actually going to ask you to, to do this, to actually log on, because after, our, after we have our panel and our Q&A, <coughs> we're going to have a poll uh, from questions that our, our, some of our sponsors have submitted. So um, this is how you do it. Uh, you've, got, you've got the login. You can find it there, or, or actually it's on the program as well. It's going to prompt you, it's going to ask you uh, for a delegate number. That's actually, in case you didn't realize, that's the number that's right. right on your badge. Um, so, so that's what you need there, and then obviously I think your email. Um, and then you'll be able to, to view, and what will happen is the poll, the poll that we'll be doing, the questions will be coming up via, the, via this app, and you'll be able to select an answer, and we'll get a live you know, measure of, uh, of your response. So it's, a, it's always an interesting... Uh, it's, you know, kind of straw poll. So in this case, I, I, I would ask you to, to log. You can do it now or we can do it then, but just to kind of warn you about that. We'll obviously also be getting, those responses will include our, our, our global audience. And uh, we do actually have a fair amount of people watching this in the US, uh, other parts of Europe, and, and if the Asians are still awake, although maybe now they can't sleep. Um, so that's, that's something to keep in mind. Um, last bit of housekeeping. On your desk, there is a feedback form evaluation form. Uh, if you are sticking around, then, then hand this into us by tomorrow. Maybe you want to uh, see more of the conference before you properly judge us, but if, especially if you're leaving earlier, please fill this in, get us back to us. We, we really value your opinions. We, we try to shape this event on, on, on what your expectations or what you think it needs to be done. Um, I don't think it's a secret that we, we review locations, we consider you know, different, different structures, and your input is really valuable to that. At the end of the conference, uh, we will do a, a, a kind of draw. We'll put the evaluation forms in a hat or whatever, and uh, the winner gets a gal confirm it is tomorrow, but gets a prize. So, you know, worth doing. But mostly, obviously, the, your feedback is what's really important to us. <clears throat> okay, let's move on, on to the session, which is headline People, Processes, and Technology uh, Managing the Globalized Supply Chain Network. I don't know, maybe the best way for me to introduce this session is to kind of briefly summarize some of the things that we've heard uh, throughout the course of today. Um, if, if any of you were, were paying attention carefully, which I appreciate, you know, isn't really a guarantee, um, you might have heard some perhaps slightly seemingly contradictory things. So we hear about increasing complexity, part numbers, sort of more model variations and stuff, but at the same time, you know, it's on more common platforms, standardized modules, and uh, in some sessions, we even heard about new technology in the future that might use things like 3D printing or, or change the whole shape of how we build a car. This may be in the distant future, it may be nearby. Maybe one of the biggest uh, sort of automotive projects, if it gets off the ground, is going to be Tesla's Gigafactory. One can even ask whether that is really going to look like anything we've seen in automotive. Is it really even an automotive factory? So. Um, it's kind of different, different forces at play. We have obviously hear a lot about globalization. We've always heard about this, um, global sourcing. But at the same time, we know 90, 95% or whatever the percentage is of the supply chain is regional, if not local. So uh, I was looking at some numbers the other day. I think it was three or four years ago, Honda exported three or 400,000 cars from Japan. 
uh, last year, that was down to 30,000. So you know, clearly regionalization is happening because they're producing those cars more in the region. But that's not true, of course, for, for every manufacturer, and it's not true for every supply chain. Um, you know, we, we looked at e-commerce. We talked about that quite a bit in, in uh, the conference today in a number of sessions. There's some debates about how much we can or should, should learn from that. You know, and is it the kind of dream supply chain or is it the nightmare supply chain? You know, in terms of some of the last mile issues that they have. And, but you know, as we heard in one session earlier, I think there's, there's perhaps more similarities than there are differences in some ways. And uh, the key takeaway for me with all these different parts is that you, know, you have to keep up with these changes. You, you have to be open to them. You have to be flexible. Somebody talked about adding new kinds of resources to their logistics company, whether that's IT skills or uh, economists or, or customs uh, intelligence and such. All of these aspects you know, are increasingly important, and maybe the logistics provider is, is providing a hell of a lot more than, than just transport. And if you're going to survive over the next five years or 10 years or 20 years, um, you have to be ready for that, which, which sort of comes to our, our theme where we focus on people and technology, you know, you know, it's not one or the other. Uh, over lunch, I was talking with a company who talked about how people, in some ways, can be a pain in the ass in this business because, you know, if you have to, uh, your driver has to stop at some point and, you know, the cargo can't move, so what can you do to, to keep your cargo moving? On the other hand, obviously, without the intelligence and the skills, and, you know, well, none of us would have a job, and, and certainly the supply chain would come to a halt. So how do we balance, how do we balance these things? Certainly training is important skills, uh, collaboration, partnership, and, uh, and, and those, those, so those for me were some of the takeaways that I've, I've been feeling today, and I do think that that builds us up very well into, into the panel that we've put together here, because um, I think everybody on this stage brings that sort of spirit of collaboration, partnership uh, to, to their work, having known, known all of these uh, individuals over the years, and, um, and I think it's going to be a great, great chance to discuss that. And, we're going to have presentations from all the panelists first, but as usual, we are really hoping for, for a lively Q&A and engagement from all of you. So let me, let me introduce them. Uh, we'll start with Andreas Ginkel, who's the Director of Logistics uh, at Opel. Uh, we'll, we'll then hear from Guy Lederet, who's the Director of the Finnish Ve Vehicle Logistics at PSA. Uh, next up, we'll hear Ray Fitzgerald. He's the President of the Americas, Europe, Middle East, and Africa. Uh, at, at WWL, just a small region that, they've, that they're working on nowadays. Uh, Frank Vorath, of course, will be our last, but certainly not least, presenter, who's the Vice President, Global Automotive Head for DHL Global Forwarding. So we've got a great mix here, inbound, outbound, logistics providers from, from every side of the equation. Um, so again, I think all the, all the ingredients for a very lively discussion. So that's more than enough from me. Let me uh, now invite Andreas Ginkel from Adam Opel. Good afternoon. And I learned just now that there is, this is not a dentist conference, right? This is the automotive conference. <laughs> so that's at least good to know. Um, from, the con from, the, from the presentation I've learned about this morning, I found that there's a couple of very interesting touch points. And one of the questions raised was, well, what is the OEM doing? What is, what is your internal organization? What are you doing internally with people, with organization, with process, with tools? So that can help eventually supporting or collaborating from our side on that, on that supply chain logistics type of activity. I guess one of the points I learned was, uh, and I got confirmed, I should say, is that we are looking into things from an end-to-end -end perspective. We are not just looking into the transportation. We are looking at, into what is steering transportation, hence what is a relevant process steps that we got to do that is in our responsibility so that we can communicate appropriately to our 3PL base, to our, to our carrier base, to our service provider base. So let me step into the first shot eventually. Sorry. Um, one of the questions that eventually helped illustrating what I was just now talking about is if you were focusing on what is or what has been operational excellence in terms of that silo manage, management of transportation? And how have we perceived that at an OEM side and how did we go about that? Well, let me call that operational excellence of the past. And then what is the role of that uh, supply chain going forward? 
And I guess there's two buzzwords I would like to utilize here, and we should hopefully discuss them to a greater degree as we, as we go about with that conference. The two buzzwords I'd like to use is there is an integrative and a coordinative role of supply chain. It is more than just executing a transport. And how do we design our processes? How do we design the organization? What tools do we need to step up to what we think we ought to do in support of what you can do for us so that we hopefully jointly generate something like a win-win and then drive an operational excellence for the future. So operational excellence in the past. How did we manage logistics? How did we, how did we look into logistics? Well, this is a dashboard. We were measuring how many damages were occurring on a car. What is the cost per unit? What is your KPI? What's your material reliability? What's your delivery reliability? And you name it. And in the end, what we are doing here is, from an OEM perspective, the observation was our, our production has to be provided with parts, if you look at the inbound side, at the lowest possible supply chain cost. That was the overruling paradigm so far. And what I guess we are seeing here is that we see that supply chain and logistics as a coordination role of various other functions within our company. As an OEM, we are... We, have it, we do have a sales function, very important on the outbound side, on the vehicle distribution side. We have a purchasing function that is buying material. We have a manufacturing that is manufacturing our cars and engines and, and transmissions. And we have our engineering side that is engineering. And we do have supply chain and logistics that are working with all of those partners. And it's all about having a coordinated approach internally within our organization um, around these functions. Why am I saying that? One of the, of the examples we had raised in the earlier conferences is when we, when we used to talk purchasing, we, were, we used to talk about buying where we have the cheapest material price. Well, that was driving up logistics cost. If you were looking into that from a total enterprise cost perspective, you might have to take both into the equation to come up with a reasonable result. And the same is true, by the way, for all the other functions. The, decree on the, the question how you are engineering an exhaust system is impacting directly your packaging and your transportation. It is impacting where you manufacture what. And in so far, it is all to be seen in the crater and we have entirely converted, so to say, into a total enterprise cost approach. So what we are doing in, in uh, what we are seeing more as operational excellence nowadays is not necessarily the old paradigm, but it's more decisions, and I should rather say, it is an entire mindset shift that we have gone through over the last number of years. Our decisions are entirely based on total enterprise cost analysis. Every sourcing that a buyer would go do is based on total enterprise costs that takes logistics cost into the equation to the extent we know it that takes manufacturing into the equation, that takes engineering into the equation, and we come up with a result that is best for the company, might sacrifice logistics, might benefit logistics. What we, what we as well do is we, are, um, we have advanced our supply capacity management. We try to further stabilize our production schedules, and I will talk to that in a greater detail. I guess one of the comments earlier this morning on the Vigal Outbound Conference was again about um, stable forecasts. And what I want to talk about here is stable production schedules because it both links and it will help us driving a greater stability and reliability into the forecasts we are providing and into the schedules we are building so it benefits outbound and, uh, and inbound logistics. We have an entirely synchronized value chain in the meanwhile. We are not just looking into elements into silos. We are looking into the entire value chain from an end-to-end -end perspective. We do a strategic risk assessment in the Wiedenwald, advanced crisis management, and um, um, the, the other buzzwords that, that came up earlier today was about innovation. I think we are very open-minded to drive what we think are uh, innovative supply chain concepts for the future. We have just recently implemented a few. I will present one or two today. Uh, for one of them that I'm not presenting, we have just received a VDA logistics award. It's about what we call order slotting. This is where you are building into the order schedule the materials that you are anticipating to receive so that you are not, so that you are not compromising the stability 
um, and that you're reflecting into that subject the material availability as you are sequencing the orders that you are building. And um, one might say, why is that not in place since 20 years? Well, good question. I don't know why. Now it is. And um, I think it is definitely helping driving stability into schedules and forecasting. Okay. Um, a bit of a provocative internal statement is, we had historically been seen as a serving function, entirely a serving function to production. And yes, that operational capab capability is a capability that needs to remain, but we need to move forward. We need to advance that into a more design of the entire value chain of our company. And this is where we envision ourselves to be in, uh, in a few years from now, and this is where we are on a development path towards and this is where we are saying it has to be cross-functional, it ought to be cross-functional, because if you are <coughs> operating within a silo, then you can't just not achieve the benefits that we think are out there and that we think we need to achieve. So it's integrative, it's innovative, it's holistic. Um, I'll skip over that chart. We do today a number of front-loading activities. I talked about this total enterprise cost that we have synchronized um, uh, value chain engineering in, in, in our entire processes from start to end in the meanwhile. So it has driven down a quite number of, of, of cost over the last couple of years. One might say Opel was forced to be innovative. Yes, we were and we are. And that's why we implemented a couple of changes out here that are benefiting the entire supply chain uh, and the entire, let's say, the entire enterprise cost approach. Now, there is a couple of future states that we still need to achieve, and here is an anchor point where I'd like to take the opportunity of standing here to commend one of the statements that I heard earlier. What I heard earlier was all about that sourcing process. Um, one of the questions that were raised in one of the earlier sessions this morning were about um, are, are OEMs not collaborating on the sourcing side? Well, let me take you one step earlier. What I want to achieve internally in my company is <coughs> that I would like to improve the utilization of my conveyances, right? I would like to rather ship a full container load from Korea to Russia, from Korea to Spain, or from wherever to wherever, rather than having others, you know, doing consolidations for us that are in the end only costing money. And you might not find that a nice statement, but what I think we ought to do is prior to communicating a schedule to our service provider base, we should be taking care for um, optimizing the schedule and optimizing it so that it is conveyance, you know, that it is <coughs> conveyance optimized. What we need to step over is an idea of worlds that we have left hopefully behind 20 years ago, where we are just simply communicating production raw demands to our supply base and in the end of wondering why our conveyances are not properly utilized. So one of the tasks that we are seeing is we've got to make sure that these schedules that we are communicating are allowing for a full container load, are allowing for a full truck load, even if that means that we've got to have more space wherever it makes total enterprise cost sense and understanding that we need to ensure stackability of these containers by driving packaging concepts. And both of these aspects are directly linking into you. Where can you support us? Is with innovation on packaging, is with innovation on, um, on routings that allow for these, uh, for these schedules to be anticipated on your side. And the second stage is, now, now we go out and source. And do you really want us to collaborate and find out and identify what best networks the microeconomics of each 3PL has? <laughs> Or is that not something that you ought to be driving respectively where we might require an integrator who is working beyond a book of business of just one OEM? And I leave that as a discussion point. I have my opinion here. I think this is something um, that you should not be delegating to the customer. You should probably be managing exactly that complexity. And I actually see that as a core task of the audience that is probably sitting out here this is your core task. Um, one of the risks always is that with not stepping up to managing that complexity and that, that, uh, that opportunities out there and delegating it to your customers, your customers can internalize that. But what is then left out there? 
out there would be the only thing that is left out there is a very hands-on operation, and I'm not sure that this is where all your where all your uh, skills are best settled, because I, I know over the last couple of years that there's a huge number, a vast number of innovations out there in the industry, and I guess that competition on brain work should complement the competition on muscle work that is out there. Okay, I talked to that total cost optimizer. I, I realized when I talk a little bit faster, we can have our cocktails cooking, right? <laughs> okay, I talked about that, that uh, front-loading elements that we are doing. <laughs> So if you, if you really think about a strategic network planning on the logistics side, that yes, some portion of that infrastructural comprehension might on a weekly basis when we are, con when we are doing our requirements run through <coughs> our production systems based on the orders that are flowing in, then you need to optimize your route plannings and your mode plannings. But prior to communicating a schedule, it has to be load optimized. That is the tactical portion of that. It as well has a prior portion, a front-loading portion of it. We got to comprehend how we best drive our sourcing. If we are plugging in a new project, a new program in one country, in one plant, then as these assumptions that we have are starting to materialize <laughs> and to get more concrete, we need to anticipate this concretization into the networks that we are planning, into the cost studies that we are doing, and into the sourcing decisions we are driving, right? And so far, that entire front-loading activity is of crucial importance. And yes, there's iterations that are required based on the knowledge that, that, we, that we can feed back from the commercials and from the routes that you are providing to us. Um, one, of the, one of the subjects is, and I'll probably make that relatively short to you, what we are, one of the other um, innovations that we are driving is not only auto slotting, where we have just now been awarded, as I said earlier, um, what we are as well driving is a synchronization of our, of our build schedules between our assembly plans and our powertrain plans. That will help us reducing some of the volatility we have. It won't go away, but it is softening the volatility, hence drives a certain um, stability into the forecast function, respectively, into the, uh, into the schedule. When I'm talking forecast, I always refer to what I'm sending out to my vehicle outbound distribution. <laughs> and when I'm talking schedule, I'm referring to my, my inbound logistics. OK. Um, um, what, we, what we are clearly perceiving is that this operational, operational excellence, and I quote that what I'm writing here, operational excellence is a question of qualified organization, appropriate tools, and discipline. And um, what we, what we, what I'm, I guess there's a couple of, couple of statements associated here. Um, it is not, I continue with node organization, with node process, and here's a new IT tool. That, that is not it, right? It all goes together, and it does not only goes, go together with what we are doing, it requires our partners out there to work on these type of innovations with us. It is not helping. If the one side is thinking to be innovative and the other side doesn't know. If I want to shoot a rocket to the moon, but the guy I'm talking to doesn't even know that the moon exists, then I have a selling problem. OK. In terms of where we would like to be, um, one of the statements here, should it, should it not go without saying that we have buildable schedules? This is why we have done our order schedule, our order slotting, as I just talked about. Shouldn't it be that the customer gets a reliable delivery date at the point of sale? When a customer buys a car, he wants to know when he's getting the car. <coughs> and on the inbound side, we are talking to windows of 15 minutes, on the outbound side, a couple of days. I heard in a discussion this morning about scanning on RFID going outbound for every car. Well, on the inbound side, on the warehousing side, we are about to reduce scanning on a panel level because it's driving cost. Are we really at equal points in, in, in terms of the implementation of all innovations on the inbound side and on the outbound side of the house. Um, shouldn't it go without saying that the operator does not need to walk and bend for parts? Shouldn't it go without saying that all inbound trucks can enter our plants without delay caused by administration? So that we know where our cars are on the way to the dealer. We touched that in a, in a, in a session a minute ago. And that the cars are picked up immediately after production. Well, here's Here's the reality. I mean, scheduling decisions are, in the meanwhile, we have changed that. I, I, I talked about that, OK? So we, we are, in the meanwhile, reflecting the buildability of a schedule into our scheduling decisions. 
which is a huge step forward. The other reality is that only about 80% of our customers' expectations in terms of delivery reliability of an outbound shipment are fulfilled. We are missing 20% of the entire vehicle reliability, current reality. To enter the plants in today's world, inbound truck drivers has to deliver piles of paper and he has to wait. The operator has to walk and bend for parts and he has to decide what's, what's to pick. The outbound pipeline is a gray box to some degree for us as a customer because we do not have a permanent oversight as to where our cars are. And so on and so forth. And what we are perceiving is that indeed the world around us, there's a couple of examples here, that the world around us is, is changing. One of the examples is that you can check in for your air travel online. <coughs> the movements at the airport attract via your, your, your Bluetooth uh, signal of your mobile. So there's numerous, numerous innovations out there that are integrated into, inter, that are integrated into the way you are behaving, into the way you are processing, into the way you are utilizing that, and this is where we think we need to use technology for, for innovative solutions. However, these innovative solutions um, require that this technology needs to be applied so that we are as well comprehending, <coughs> we jointly got to re-engineer and simplify our process. So, so that's this technology that is out there, the processes adjustments that are required, and the organizations that comprehend it on both sides are in a position to really get the best benefits out there and not just show a statement of innovation out there that nobody in the end can really implement or materialize. I guess I'll leave it with that. Thank you very much for your attendance. Okay, thank you very much, Andreas, for a very interesting presentation, an honest one, looking at some of the strides that Opal has made, obviously, and also where there's, obviously, um, room for improvement. Just a quick note, anyone standing in the back, we have plenty of seats in the front. I promise our panel doesn't smell badly, anyway, so. Uh, um, next up, um, if you, any of you have looked into your delegate bags, by the way, you might recognize uh, the face here. This is a cover, cover story interview on our latest issue. Looks pretty good, if I don't mind saying so myself. Guy Lidere from PSA. So thank you, Chris. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, so Chris asked me to, 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 to stick in a very strict formalization of uh, the aim of this session. So I, I try to stick in that and, and after all to tell me, okay, but be, be fast, please, because after that we have the dinner and it's, uh, it's the most interesting part. Okay. So trying to, to do that quickly. Uh, I'm asked to, to tell you a bit about managing the globalized supply chain. Um, I, I won't say a word about the inbound supply chain because it's not possible to say anything more than uh, what uh, you, you told before. Um, uh, that's, uh, that's a pity and uh, hopefully I'm more on the outbound supply chain and, and uh, inventory management. So it's trying to be complementary. I want to, uh, to, 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 to just outline you a kind of elements of our strategy, which was when the point which has been asked, have been asked for. Um, a second one I, I didn't really understood, but after, after, after thinking about it, it was not that, that stupid, but what is supply chain alignment? That is for you, uh, who are maybe more working on logistics, in which kind of way of working does is all your troubles you experience, or variability, your difficulties, in, in which framework does that in, integrate and how you can be in the outbound side uh, a really efficient and, uh, and powerful tool for our global performance. And the third one is, I understood that the, the theme of this, of this year is working on the assets. Is that right? Okay, first. So, uh, what, what are our assets and um, how do we work on? So I just to give one point about that. So, first point, supply chain, or supply chains, or just chains. Uh, I don't want you to, 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 to enter in this dreadful, uh, let's say, uh, little w workflow, because uh, it, it, first it's in French, so that is unbearable. <laughs> uh, 
the only interesting point I, I just want to, to, to show you on the outbound, but you know that very, uh, very, very clearly, I believe, is that you can see a little red star. It has nothing <coughs> to do with our business in, in Russia, but uh, it, it just shows you the, the points, the different points in our supply chain where we're, uh, in fact, as a new EM, uh, sell our cars. We sell our cars to you directly, oh, I hope some of you here. Yeah. Uh, when you're going uh, uh, an, an, an internal dealership, of our, which is of our own, we sell cars to uh, a number of partners, we sell cars to uh, some uh, wholesale in different countries, and each of them has its specific way of working. So in fact, if you, if you think about supply chain in the outbound side, it, it's, a, it, it's real supply chains and, uh, and all this is very, very linked to our business. That means the way we're selling the cars. And I'll come back to it. It's not quite a, a, a linear way of working and you know that very clearly. So what is our strategy to, to answer the, 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 the dreadful uh, Chris uh, questions? The, the, the first one is uh, we see our supply chain and our outbound supply chain uh, are really a, a, as a business tool. We are here, of course, to cut the cost. We are here, of course, to lower the inventory. But the first point we need to do is to help our sales people, which are, that this is a difficult uh, job, I mean, the technical one, sorry for you, but uh, it's something you're always uh, able to manage. But the sales, this is, this is something very difficult. So we need to be sales-oriented, flexible, and uh, we're not uh, a cost, of course, when, when you ask uh, any, uh, any of our boss, what is the, the logistics, it's a dreadful cost. Yes, but it's also a way of uh, getting the, let's say, the part of the market share, the last day of the month, and, uh, and getting the, the last client in order to, to, to get all uh, this, uh, this revenue in the, 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 our uh, company. And, of course, uh, our strategy is, of, is to manage the performance in terms of costs, and we had an, an extensive uh, presentation of that, but also of, in terms of cash inventory, uh, and of course, for you, uh, customer satisfaction. And when I think about customer as a supply chain uh, manager, that means final customer, you, but also the dealers, which are, for me, part of our assets. So, to achieve this strategy, as I mentioned, all the, the, the business are different. If you are exporting vehicles to uh, Angola or, uh, uh, or, or dealing to, uh, to, to for vehicles for uh, the Bonn region, uh, we need, of course, uh, tailored-made logistics. And uh, that means that it needs to integrate the market specificity. And the market is not only physical way on how the car moves and why, where are they stored. But how they are sale. The clear and, and very easy uh, input of uh, should I work in terms of build to order or build to stock, which is quite simple when you're speaking of parts, is more complex because you can build to order a car uh, for one country, which is uh, very specific, and build to stock to uh, be able to uh, <coughs> to deal with the, uh, I don't know, the, the Great Britain uh, uh, dreadful uh, March months, dreadful in terms of logistics, of course. So this is to be taken into account, uh, and, uh, and it's very important and, 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 and tricky for the, the logistics. And the second one is, uh, is between brackets, because uh, it's all uh, our dream, is to get a logistic which is self-improving. That means able to uh, change its, uh, let's say, basics, to change uh, its uh, network the most quickly possible. And this, uh, this speed is part of the, of the performance, not of today, but of tomorrow. And this is one of the challenges in terms of logistics for the future years, according to me. So the supply chains, now, uh, alignment, well, I uh, just want to, outlook, to, 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 to outline what kind of alignments we, do we speak about. Um, first of all, uh, industrial versus uh, market alignments. 
you know or you all know that uh, the, the, the industrial wants something to be fully stable each and every day to produce the, mem the same uh, car, uh, black one, and uh, for the same uh, country, and nothing moves. Well, this is not our DNA. Our DNA is to uh, give to our sales department flexibility. But flexibility shouldn't be a kind of, uh, a, 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 of an ashtray where you put everything in that and say, okay, the industrial just, uh, just try to, 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 to make something of that and uh, on my forecast, I, I'll, I'll give you them uh, after I, I sold the car. No, uh, it's an agreed flexibility, which must be transverse from the supplier, the production, of course, you as a logistic uh, 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 storage, bit, everything must be agreed on that. And uh, the, the second, second point, which is very important, is that, uh, of course, it seems, uh, it seems to be completely uh, impossible. But however, we have things that improve that. We're having global production for local market. Each local market is very valuable, but the global production in the plants are uh, much more stable. So, in fact, the fact that we massify in, in, in plants and uh, in uh, the most uh, massified logistic uh, capacity possible helps us to, to achieve that. As I mentioned, uh, we don't speak about the same thing when we are uh, working in, uh, in production or, or in market. The market during the months is very slow at the beginning and very fast at the end. And the production wants to produce each and every day the same thing. So this is for uh, the album logistics, the very tricky point. Here you have to, uh, let's say, uh, make this kind of uh, uh, of terrible gap between all these points. And the way of managing that uh, quite in, I mean, uh, efficiently is the crew of, uh, of this alignment. Uh, second alignment, uh, I discussed about it. Our, our supply chain is not here to, to only be cost. It's here to, 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 to get in some revenue for uh, our sales department. How do we uh, align this cost and the, cap the capability to get this revenue. Um, this is uh, something that integrates, of course, logistic cost. You are a big part of it, and uh, we need uh, undoubtedly to work on that and to work very in deep. But also cash. Uh, the, our device needs to, to, to help us to, to, to reduce cash and to integrate all the fiscal, the customs, the invoicing processes, which on the album are very, very, very uh, important. And if you don't integrate and align each and every uh, uh, part of this, it, 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 it won't work. Uh, after it's more classical, I mean, it's, uh, well, can we decide the, the, the best balance between service, uh, that's uh, for you and for uh, the dealers and, and cost optimization, including lead time optimization, final customer accuracy. Uh, we, we discussed it uh, in the early afternoon. We, not, we need to, to know uh, as Amazon to, to tell you exactly when, where is the car, when <coughs> will be delivered. And uh, yes, it's, uh, it's important. It's, uh, however, a long, a long way to be uh, honest to, to get something perfect on this point. And the last point is, uh, it's of course, quality and cost of optimization. Uh, and uh, should we go fast or should we, should we go green? Which is uh, another more uh, recent issue, let's say, that way. Well, when you look at this, you say, okay, uh, quite complicated, a lot of things to integrate. Uh, how do we do, do that? So uh, a lot of people came to me and say, okay, uh, we've got uh, perfect and brilliant tools with multi-parameter optimization. We'll find the best way of working uh, on that. And um, okay, um, the point that I want to outline here is that it's complicated. And according to me, because I'm maybe not that intelligent, uh, it's not possible to do that. And I, unfortunately, for the, let's say the, the kind of uh, IT providers, I, I, I won't uh, uh, believe in, the, in this kind of proposition. So, uh, so how, how do we work on the assets on our side? 
first, first asset, I think it's, uh, it's obvious, but it's the customer satisfaction. So uh, uh, deliver accuracy uh, for the dealers to be the quickest possible. Um, uh, and of course, to, 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 to give the, the, the minimum cost uh, for, uh, for, for, in, for the vehicle deliver. The second point is the human, the human assets. Our world is complex, our models are complex, we're more and more international. Uh, if, we, if, we, if we think about it five minutes, what, what, is, what is the important point? The difficult and crucial point is the expertise and the capacity to improve continuously. Um, we didn't spoke a lot of, about that, but uh, the, 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 this is one, or maybe for me the crucial, uh, asset we need to develop and will be only possible to develop to develop that with you the, the LSPs of course the OEMs in partnership with the others we're all fully linked on uh, on, uh, on these uh, items with uh, uh, a lot of, uh, of you uh, or other OEMs and it's uh, it's very rich to 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 to, to be better and, and and to improve continuously on that and of course, there were assets, but it's a result, is the profitability. And I don't speak about cost. Here again, is the optimum cost, inventory, service. So, okay, as that's clear, how do we work on? So I already said that, okay, the, 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 the brilliant tool that makes uh, the, 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 the global optimum between uh, 255 parameters, and say, okay, this is the point I, I, I really don't believe in. First of all, on the outbound, like uh, Andreas showed us on, on more in the inbound, is to think and act global. You can optimize a route. What is the impact on uh, service rate? What is the impact on uh, delivery time? What is the impact on uh, compound capacity? Everything of that needs to be integrated and the most important, what is the impact on our dealers? The second point, and it will be my conclusion, in fact, uh, is uh, make it simple and uh, what I would call one change per day approach. What does that mean? What does that, does that mean? Sorry. It means that uh, regarding all the alignment necessary, if you want to, to integrate everything, the only thing you do is you don't move. Never. So you have to, <coughs> to pull the system along one way. And after, to check that all the other parameters will improve, or at least uh, not uh, uh, fully and, and drastically uh, decrease. We decided last year to, to work on uh, inventory. That means to, to, to drastically work uh, on inventory, not just uh, Kaizen or continuous improvement, but to, uh, to reduce. And let's say that way, we didn't know if this would have any impact on customer satisfaction, and uh, lead time, and so on. But we were convinced, and uh, at every, uh, uh, in each and every step of the, uh, of the company, that this was uh, the, the, the good way to do that. And uh, we achieved that, and it's now in our results, and uh, managed to reduce by just putting really the, the stress on that, uh, a reduction on, uh, of uh, 1.3 billion of uh, inventory <coughs> in one year. And with that, we had no customer satisfaction trouble because of course we checked that very closely. We had in fact uh, no uh, more expenses on the supply chain cost or very, very little to be honest. And, uh, and our financial results in, in improved also. Okay, there are needs still to be improved, but 
at least it's a beginning. So that's the make it simple and just one big change and not every change on every uh, items in the same day. Thank you for that. <laughs> okay, thank you very much for that. Again, Guy, uh, giving us an overview of some of the changes there at PSA. Uh, interesting, very interesting points at the end there about inventory reduction and, and you know, what, what that, what that the overall impact on the business. Some of that I'm sure we'll come back to on the Q&A. Uh, next up, Ray Fitzgerald from WWO. Good afternoon, everyone. It's very nice to be here today. You're in the home stretch. How's the energy in the room? <laughs> okay, we'll do our best to try to lift it up a little bit. Rather than take on the three technical questions, I chose to focus on the theme of the conference. And it's possible to take people, processes, and technology in a number of different directions. One option is to consider each in terms of, is it a business enabler? or is it a business differentiator? So I'd like to start and offer a perspective from WWL that says technology as it relates to systems and applications is really an enabler. Simple yet robust technology solutions that provide visibility and data for analysis and dynamic decision making has rapidly become an essential core competency for any logistics company out there today. Nonetheless, it's an enabler. Processes. Processes are important, and they're really the figurative cogs in the machine. Processes guide an organization's execution, and for best-in-class companies, they're indispensable in shaping ways of working. Without them, efficiency and effectiveness would suffer. But processes aren't the key defining element in most companies. So we view those as business enablers. Now, if you will contrast those statements with people, many of you will probably say that people are business enablers too. And that's a true statement. But I would argue that the right people working as a team with a focus and an aligned goal really can be key differentiators for business success and really bring competitive advantage to your company. People are the most important element of the three and that's where I'd like to focus my comments today. So competitive advantage, we've all heard the term, but what really is it? I like the description given by the author, uh, uh, Jim Collins, who wrote the book Good to Great. In that, he talks about his hedgehog concept. And this term comes from really the age-old battle between the fox and the hedgehog. The fox who is trying to eat the hedgehog is smart, is clever, is sleek, and is fast. The hedgehog is none of those things. The fox does many things well. The hedgehog does one thing really, really well it defends itself by rolling up and protecting itself with its spines until the fox is deterred. And more times than not, the fox goes away frustrated. The hedgehog's defense is its competitive advantage. Jim Collins asks that every company should talk to themselves and answer three questions to find their competitive advantage. One is, what are you passionate about? Two is, what are you or what can you be the best in the world at? And number three, very importantly, is where do you make your money? That's your competitive advantage. So if you will, allow me to draw a corollary to that graph, to this graph, which is not very pretty in terms of colors, now that I see it on the screen, but the evolving elements of the supply chain taking really the same approach. So starting with the product and the network, as a logistics provider, that at its core is really our technology, right? Uh, the technology in the vessels that we have, the design of those vessels, the capability of those vessels, 
how we manage supply chain competence for many of our customers around the world, and of course the systems and applications that I referred to earlier. The way we came to this, at least on the ocean in the past, has been a really straightforward model. We look for volume flows around the world where there's critical mass between ports. We deploy vessels in those trades to handle the cargo needs. And then we wait for that cargo to come and we try to incent that cargo to come. So you build a network and then the customers come to that network on a multi-user basis. That has been completely turned on its head in the last five years. In that the customers are now saying to us, here's my need, bring to us your product. So what's facilitated that change? It's really what we call fragmentation, where there is movement of manufacturing from traditional places to many different places around the world. And there are lots of reasons for why this is. The fragmentation can be a result of uh, competitive issues, competitive issues related to cost, improved labor, better quality, currency fluctuations, risk mitigation. There are all sorts of, number, uh, of factors behind it. But the reality is our world is changing and we've been forced to be much more agile and flexible in the past. We have very expensive assets, we need critical mass. This is forcing us to completely rethink how we manage our business on the ocean. So it's become situational and elastic to the points in the bullet. Moving down to process management, if you think about your process, you've got to constantly validate your processes based on the changes that you see in the marketplace. And if you look at efficiency and effectiveness, effectiveness is doing the right things. Efficiency is doing things well. We see so many companies, and we were guilty of this ourselves, we focused mostly on efficiency. We were looking for incremental gains in efficiency on things that we had always done. The reality is, as our world changes as quickly and as rapidly as it is, you've got to make sure you're doing the right things before you look for that incremental gain through optimization. And then I come to people, people culture, and values. And these are really interrelated. And the people, if you want to attract the best people, they need to work in a universe that is a culture that provides them nourishment, encouragement, and growth. And to have a culture like that, your company needs to embrace values. So if you think about that, for, to attract the right people, you have to have a great culture. To have a great culture, you have to have the right values. To enforce those values and make sure everyone's living by those values, you have to have great people. You follow? It's a connected flow. So when we're out there looking for key people, like we like to call it the three C's. We look for competence because you've got to post for not only your immediate needs, but where you think you see your business is going and hire the right competence. We look for character. Does the character of these individuals fit and their personal values fit with the corporate values that we have? And then the third one is really probably the most difficult and when we get it wrong, this is where we get it wrong. And that's in the chemistry. Do the people that you hire, can they play well in the sandbox can they play well with other people and work on a team? That's something that you can't always see right out of the start. So attitudes and behaviors are very, very important to maintain that culture. And there are five that we really try to strive. Focus and work as one team. Accept accountability. Insist on fundamental change. Insist on simplicity. And last but not least, Make sure that everyone in the organization, irrespective of your role, is focused on total customer satisfaction. Then you as an enterprise can deliver that all together. Okay, so we've all heard this phrase since we've been in business. And the question is, is it accurate? And I think I would say that it is accurate, but it's the right people are the most important asset in the corporation. And the recruit, retain, and develop pieces, they're all interrelated too. Many companies do a very good job of recruiting excellent people, but they don't have the, the structure or the culture in place to retain those people. Other companies can recruit people just fine, and they retain the people too long, but unfortunately, as business changes, they're retaining the wrong types of talent to be successful in the future. And then when it comes to development, very, very few companies do that well. It's important to do all three of these things well, 
and engagement is a big, big part of that. And the way you engage someone who's in their 50s versus the way you engage someone today who are in, is in their 20s or 30s is very, very different, and I'd, I'd like to come back to that. So, many of you have probably heard the term VUCA. VUCA is an ac acronym which stands for Volatile, Uncertain, Complex, and Ambiguous. We live in a VUCA world. And if you look at all those bullets on the left side of this slide, these are the things that we typically tend to focus on in our business. But as our world is changing as dramatically and as quickly as it is, the question is, are we really focused on the right things? And I would like to just talk a little bit about the impact of a VUCA world. So the first thing, a lot of us have considered transformation as an event in time. But if you think about transformation today with the speed and the frequency of change that we're seeing in all dimensions of our business, you can't think of transformation as, event, as an event in time anymore. It's an era. And if not an era, it's a constant state that we're all in. And that's something that we have to get comfortable being uncomfortable with. Business models change. So it's kind of interesting that today, it's exactly 13 and a half years ago today that the World Trade Center uh, um, attacks happened. How many videos of that attack exist? One. That's amazing. If something interesting happened today, there would be hundreds if not thousands of videos. And the reason for that is cell phone cameras were not invented 13 and a half years ago. That's mind boggling to think about that. This bullet says that Kodak had 163,000 employees 10 years ago. They had a lock on the film industry. That is all gone in a decade. When Facebook bought Instagram two years ago, how many employees did Instagram have? 13. 13 employees in Instagram compared to the 163,000 people at Kodak 10 years ago. Here's an example. So I had the benefit um, two weeks ago of being invited by one of our top customers to their top 150 executive uh, team meeting where they included me for three days where they discussed strategy direction and what we can do for them uh, as, a, as a key supplier. And one of the discussions that they talked about was how 3D printers are going to change their industry. They talked about 3D printing parts for their machines. And this is heavy, heavy machinery. Talk about printing parts of machines at job sites. <coughs> they talked about printing uh, pieces for their machinery in factories. This was all new to me. They talked about insourcing what they outsource today. They can print things on industrial printers that meet the hardness requirements of the metal and the steel that they have in their machines today. This is mind boggling. And it really had me starting to think about what is this going to do for the logistics industry? How is this going to change? For the car people in the room, those of you who saw the last James Bond movie, I love the Aston Martin. That is a beautiful car, but that is one expensive car. And as a logistics person, I will never have an Aston Martin at the price point. So when they destroyed that car, I almost cried in the movie theater. But guess what? That car that they destroyed was printed on a 3D printer. It wasn't one of the original Aston Martins. So what is this going to do for design in the future? What is this going to do for concept cars? What is this going to do for prototypes in all businesses? It's amazing to start to think about how this is going to happen. A bit of a provocative statement here. All intelligent action results from a brilliant question. Enron, one of the biggest companies in the world 15 years ago, it collapsed in the span of a couple of months. What started that collapse? It was a young analyst at a stock meeting asking the CEO whether or not he thought the company was overvalued. That single question spurred all sorts of other questions and inquiries that just snowballed and collapsed the company. Now I'm going to date myself a little bit with this other example, but Polaroid, the instant pictures that would come out and develop before your eyes, that came about because the CEO of Polaroid was on vacation with his daughter. 
And he took a picture of his young daughter in front of something, and she wanted to see the picture immediately. And she was relentless on him. Why can't I see that picture now? So he got his R&D people together, and within two years, Polaroid had invented that film. They changed that industry, albeit for a short period of time. The future has already arrived. It's just unequally distributed. For those of you sitting in the room, how many don't yet recognize that the new gateway from Europe to Asia is through the Med? It's already here. For the people from North America who are familiar with the West Coast labor strike that just frustrated cargo and customers and shipping companies, once the Panama Canal is open in 2016 and can accommodate the larger ships, how many of those ports on the West Coast of North America recognize that their distribution in the future is going to be limited to west of the Rocky Mountains. It's not going to be all of North America like it is today. The fragmentation that I talked about earlier, what is that going to mean for my company? The 3D printing, what is that going to mean for all of our companies? Interesting things. So with all this change and the speed of change and technology and innovation that we're facing, the question is what types of people should you be hiring? So it's a fairly general question, so it deserves a fairly general answer. And I would say that you want to hire diverse people. But many of you are thinking, okay, diverse, that means people different from one another. I would have you say that you should think about that in terms of different for one another, which changes the whole context of the statement. If people are different for one another, they're bringing different skills, different knowledge, different perspectives, and different capabilities that will enable you to play more effectively on the global stage. And one other question, how will those diverse people bring value to your company in the future? And we have a perspective that really the one way that's going to be most impactful is through leadership. And leadership has lots of different uh, definitions, but here's one I like from a gentleman that I'm lucky to know. Doug Conan, he's the former CEO of Campbell Soup Company and is now the chairman of the board of Avon Products. He says that leadership is a series of authentic interactions that reinforce clear goals and consistent messages. And he likes to say that the recipe is simple. Step one, do it. Step two, do it again. Step three, see step two. Okay, I will pull all of this together in a moment, I promise you. So, in WWL, we think that leadership, the right people, will be our competitive advantage in the future. And we've earmarked certain people in the organization that we think have the capability, and we manage this over a number of years in different steps. We give them uh, exposure to external leadership programs, and we start to bring them along with work experience. Then we bring that in, and we have regional leadership programs that we engage them in. Then we push them back out again to a company called the Center for Creative Leadership, which has a series of different leadership programs culminating with a program called Leadership at the Peak. Really is excellent, excellent programs. And then once again, we bring them back in at the, at the pinnacle of their career as they're about to launch into more senior positions. And we do this in collaboration with an international business graduate school that's well known. And we put probably about 24 people through this program every 18 months. And I say this openly because I have three people sitting in this audience, which were, or these three gentlemen are on this path. So this is a very, very important thing for our future as we see it. Leadership is essential for the future. So to sum up here quickly, it's important that we all see the whole picture and not just focus on the 23 different elements that are listed under these six categories. Those are tactical issues. Are we asking each other the right questions? Are we seeing the whole picture for the future? So I would just sum up by saying that to have competitive in the advantage in the future for your company, you have to in hire, develop, retain the right people, engage them, and with doing that, you'll be able to win in the marketplace. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Ray. Uh, I think really raising some very important <laughs> issues there. Obviously challenging everyone a bit, um, focusing on the importance of leadership, forcing you to ask yourself, I'm sure, if you are a Kodak, potentially. Hopefully none of you are. Uh, hopefully you're more like Instagram and someone's going to come by you for a couple of billion, if, if nothing else at least. Um, but maybe DHL for all we know. So <laughs> let me now invite Frank Boris from DHL. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, Andreas instructed us to, to speak fast. So Andreas, I promise you I will give it a try. But I'm very glad to be here today to talk about a topic I'm, I'm really passionate about, which is people, which is about us, which is about the talent, which is about the talent crisis. The automotive industry is facing a, a crisis currently. It's not about product innovation. It's not about safety recalls. It's not about shortage of supplier. It is about people, and especially about the supply chain talent and the rapidly growing shortage that could put brakes on the industry ability to grow and prosper. Today's presentation is about to create awareness that there's a supply chain talent crisis, but also to launch the G the automotive white paper DHL has sponsored and to share some lessons learned and to propose solutions and a call for change to overcome the current and future threats of our industry. I recently met with a CEO of one of um, a main automotive manufacturer and he told me about a story in his life which has had an impact, a very, very negative impact in his environment. So consider the following scenario. This OEM planned to launch a complex vehicle in four different global locations based on his platform strategy. Two of the locations were in emerging markets where the lack of infrastructure and availability of supply chain skills and talent complicated an already difficult launch. The problem was the lack of supply chain expertise ended up in multiple um, disruptions in this OEM supply chain. Supplier capacity management, supply chain network design, supply chain risk management, none were up to the task. The impact, the supply chain cost exceeded the budgeted program cost by more than 15%. The launch was delayed in two of the four locations in the emerging market and resulted in a drop of 5% in market share. A very, very, very painful lesson for those OEM. And the potential high cost to the automotive supply chain executives of doing, of doing not enough about it, or let me rephrase, if we don't do enough about it, it will end up in more operational disruptions, in higher supply chain costs, but also in lower market share and in credibility loss. <coughs> Does that sound familiar to you? But even if so, the main question is, are there any solutions out there? So the automotive white paper, I'm going to talk now about it, outlines certain options, but let's start to give you an overview of how this automotive white paper got developed. We have partnered with an independent researcher, Lisa Harrington, from the Maryland University to investigate with automotive players on the topic of the supply chain talent crisis. You see them up there, we are very proud about that. And in order to develop the paper, Lisa have engaged with OEMs, 
tier one suppliers, academics, universities, and other institutions. This collaboration was very important to have a full understanding and view of the problem, but also to discuss potential solutions, how to tackle it together. Just want to make some, some comments, and there was an unbelievable excitement and an unbelievable collaboration there. And um, some of the people commented on that. Like John Moulton from Johnson Control said, um, there's no magic talent pool in our industry. Another comment made by Matthias Brown from Volkswagen, uh, with so many retirements looming on the horizon, the automotive industry must get serious about capturing people's knowledge before it literally walks out the door. So some really, really serious issues. But let's give you some more key insights on this automotive white paper. The automotive supply chain has become more complex and number of components has doubled over the last decade. In 2014, the automotive industry has sold um, approximately 72 million cars and it's expected to sell approximately 92 million cars. I've seen some other numbers, 110 million car cars. But the message is, this is a, predictive, a predicted industry growth of approximately 28%. We have seen a shift from the developed markets into more emerging markets. I believe we all build our future and growth on the prediction of what is going on in the emerging markets. Um, we are all facing challenges around global sourcing, global production, global supply chain management, global risk management, and the fact that vehicles have become increasingly complex. The number of components have doubled and are continues to rise in terms of comfort, safety, technology, connectivity. OEMs have adopted a platform strategy in order to reduce cost and to optimize production. And the prediction is that even the product model life cycles will reduce from an average of five years to three years. So the main question is really about how do we want to grow our industry but out of sufficient enough supply chain expertise and talent. But let me uh, give you some more insights around this talent gap. The complexity combined with the lack of talent results in a perfect storm. A 2014 report by Supply Chain Insight looked at the demand between supply, uh, sorry, looked at the gap between the demand and availability of supply chain professionals, which is going to expand. Between 2010 and 2020, it is expected that we have an increase of more than 26%. The gap is particularly serious at middle management level. So the question is also here around, um, we have an increase in the demand and we also have an increase in our industry's growth, so how do we want to cope with that? So let's have a look into some of the key <coughs> drivers behind this supply chain talent crisis. The five drivers of the supply chain talent perfect storm. The rising demand. I've just spoken about the stats that we have an increase on the demand side of more than 26%. The demand is on the rise across all industries. That means we are in competition with other industries around the best supply chain talents. But also growing demographic uh, gap. The gap between demand and availability of supply chain professionals is only going to expand. One of the key reasons is an aging workforce. Between 25 and 33% of all supply chain professionals are at or beyond retirement age. This is also not a really, really good picture. 
expanding skill set requirements is another driver. As supply chain matures as a profession, the skill set of its practitioner will change. Today, it's not only important to have just analytical tools and skills, it's more important to have a combination between analytical skills, but also leadership skills and softer skills, such as emotional intelligence and creativity. The potential faculty shortage. So what about the capacity of academia to create new talent? Also here, the picture doesn't look really good. The number of business field faculties in transportation, logistics, and supply chain is consistently below 1.3% based on all business field industry faculties in the United States and worldwide. A really shocking picture. So what about the last driver, which is the profession's image problem? Within the automotive industry, supply chain as a profession has an image problem. Very severe in emerging markets, especially in the markets where we all want to grow. Some of the reasons are the lack of understanding what supply chain is, but also supply chain has not been seen as an attractive career path, and the lack of education programs to change these perceptions. So I've spoken quite a bit about the problem. So let's have a look into some of the potential solutions. Solving the crisis, five alternatives that must be considered by supply chain ex executives. Number one, industry collaboration. I believe that's why we are here. That's why we are attending the, the conference. I've heard a lot about collaboration today. But the automotive industry, car makers, component suppliers, logistics service providers, academics, universities must take a more proactive stand in resolving this talent crisis. Leaders in our industry, they must work together with universities and with academics to develop more supply chain education programs. Expanding in-house options. Facing with the lack of education programs, some of the industry players have taken the matter in their own hands already. They have developed their own in-house uh, programs. Uh, VW just started with an academy where they're really taking practical but also strategic parts into consideration. But it won't be enough. I believe we need more a firm industry a commitment here to overcome the problem. Job rotation programs. Job rotation can be a very, very effective way to grow people. Rotate supply chain professionals will enrich their skills, but also gives them a deeper understanding of the business. Formalized knowledge transfer. With so many retirements looming on the horizon, the automotive industry must get serious about capturing people's knowledge before it literally walks out the door. Companies could set up formal programs where the soon to retire supply chain professional transfers his knowledge to the younger colleague under a formal program. And last but not least, becoming an employer of choice. Companies need to do more to retain the supply chain talent they have. Remember, we are in competition with other industries. And that means they need to take steps to ensure that they have an attractive work place. So let's have a look into industry collaboration. I believe it's a topic we have spoken a lot today about it. So I want to give you an example. One key alternative to be considered is the collaboration of industry players to develop supply chain education programs. 
In 2013, DHL, together with the main German logistics association called BVL, has started an initiative called CALA 4.0, which is aimed at addressing the talent gap. CALA stands for Corporate Automotive Logistics Academy. And the objective of CALA is to provide an industry platform for knowledge transfer, knowledge exchange, industry collaboration, and lifelong learning. It is structured in eight modules, and it's around the entire product life cycle. So let's have a look what one of the key participants had to say about Carla. Frank Bauer from, from Bosch mentioned, we see the urgent need to establish a learning platform to ensure competitiveness and to drive talent. A very, very, very strong message. So my presentation comes to an end, but before I end, I would like to make some final comments. Companies with the best supply chain talents will be more profitable and gain a competitive advantage. Today's presentation was about to deliver three messages. The awareness that there is a supply chain talent crisis. The awareness that we need a firm industry commitment. And the awareness that we need to change and collaborate to create a sustainable future of our industry. So thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you very much, Frank, highlighting uh, some very <coughs> critical issues there. Uh, I suppose the good news is, is that because you're all so old, you're soon going to be able to you know, take your pensions and go, go live in the South and relax. In the meantime, the supply chain you know, takes some risks. So, uh, I mean, people my age probably don't have any illusions that we're ever really going to be able to retire anyway, so maybe you want to rely on, rely on some of your younger talent as well. But in all seriousness, I do think that the human resources issues that are coming up by the last two presentations are obviously show just how important people and skills are uh, to this industry and, and to the supply chain, and uh, I, th I, thank, I thank our panelists for share, excuse me, sharing those views. We've obviously run a bit over. I know your cocktails are waiting. Uh, I'll try, try not to delay that too long. Are there any questions uh, from the audience? I actually shouldn't have said that because it kind of made it sound like I was going to let you off just you know, by not asking a question and then go. But uh, it is a good opportunity, if, obviously, if anybody would like to, to ask a question. I think they're doing the bar. They, <laughs> well, they might have been at the dental convention and took some Novogaine or laughing gas or whatever it is they use to uh, put them to sleep or something. Um, in that case, what we'll do is we'll do the survey uh, whilst we, we have everybody here, and, um, and we might as well do that because it's, it is a good opportunity to, to, to get those responses, and then we can go out and enjoy the, uh, the, the gala dinner. So um, if you remember, or we'll, we'll flash it up again, can we log into the live system? If we can just get that holding slide up. Maybe if we can remind, remind everyone. You can get this on our, on our homepage. Uh, then you go to the event tab, and then there's the live, the live section. Or you can follow this, this conference website link, which you see, sorry, which you see up there. Log in with your delegate number and your, your email address. <clears throat> a, a message for those of you watching outside the room. Uh, the rest of the people in the room can ignore me or continue to ignore me as you... Um, <laughs> the, the question, there's a bit of a time delay between what we, uh, we, we broadcast and, and what's happening here. That's for obvious kind of transmission reasons and also so if somebody says a bad word, we can bleep it out. But uh, don't, don't look at, um, don't listen to what I say. Look at your screen when the question pops up. Again, this is for now people in the room. Uh, and answer the question as it, as it comes up on the screen, and that way you'll be able to vote in sync with everybody here uh, in, in the audience. Um, give you all a minute or so to, to, to get set with that. Okay. So these questions 
were provided, as, as mentioned, by, by our, our gold sponsors. And uh, so it's a good, you know, these are from, from the industry. All right, let's kick it off. So this question is from Priority Freight. What is the biggest single threat to continued global automotive growth? Is it large oil price fluctuations? Is it recession in China? Is it deflation in Europe? Is it insecurity caused by Russia? Or in fact, is, it, is there no real threat to global growth right now? So, got a little bit of time to answer. Sorry, we had a little delay there. Maybe you can. End. A slowdown or recession in China, 26% is what uh, we're seeing as the potential biggest risk. Whoa, take that back. I take that back. Obviously, we were buffering. Uh, okay, there's no, 39% of you say there's no real threat to global growth. I don't know if that's a lot of opt optimism. Um, or, or in fact, if it's more of a reflection that, that it's, uh, these, these particular threats are localized and so don't necessarily threaten the globe. It depends on, I guess, how you read that. But um, maybe we can read that kind of positively. No real, no real. But, but nonetheless, 26% and 17% of you do see China and, and Russia as potential threats. All right, let's go to the next question. This one is from Evolution Time Critical. Manufacturing continues to shift towards lower cost countries where the infrastructure and transport can be poor and management complex. Uh, what do you see as the supply chain risk? Oh, yeah, what is the level of risk? Is it, a, is it high risk? Is it additional risk? Is this acceptable risk? Is it a little change in risk? Or is it low risk? So does this move to these countries represent, as, as mentioned, high, additional, acceptable, little or, or very low, low risk? Please vote now. Overwhelmingly there, it's, it's obviously risk. So it's, it's, you know, I think if my maths are right, 76% of you see high or additional risk from, from these moves. Uh, so obviously this is risky business. And uh, maybe we've seen that by some of the regionalization or near sourcing, whatever you want to call it. I think Evolution re recently flew in some, uh, some press from another country, from China, by like, you know, huge airplanes to, to the UK. So obviously there are definitely risks and, and costs involved. Next question is from WWL. Where is the most inefficiency in global supply chains? Do you see this in upstream planning and coordination? Is it in communicating planning changes? Is it in handover phases? Is it KPIs and performance measurement? Or is it quality control and, and damage loss control? So where do you see the most inefficiency? Again, very close. Uh, communicating planning changes and handover phases, but, but really upstream planning. So the, the, obviously quite a, few, quite a few inefficient points in the supply chain there. Next question from Jeff Go. <clears throat> Cooperation in which of these areas would deliver the most benefit in reduced costs or lead time in 2015? Inbound network engineering, uh, packaging management and pooling, Finished vehicle long distance flows, aftermarket parts warehousing delivery, or, and delivery, uh, or you don't see any significant improvements this year. So where, where for you, or where do you see uh, the biggest focus for this year? Finished vehicle is uh, the biggest risk, but, but followed closely by in, inbound network engineering. So quite a lot of opportunity, perhaps, for improvement in both those areas. Um, less 
here in the, in the packaging management and pooling. I'm sure there's some strong opinions against that in the 9%, but uh, okay, so interesting answers there. Next question is from CTM. Uh, this, how significant are empty miles, whether it's rail, road, or ocean, in the cost of delivering finished vehicles? Is this the most significant factor or, or one of the most significant factors? Uh, is it a high significance? Is it sort of second or third level challenge? Is it just, just one more cost that you have to deal with? Or is it not really significant? So specific to finished vehicles, uh, how, how significant are empty miles? It's a high significance. That's obviously pretty overwhelming there. And a couple also say it's the most significant, but 70% of you I think it's very significant. Next question from Chep. What is your average utilization of a standard C container? Is it, is it higher than 90%? Is it higher than 75%? Is it higher than 60%? Or let's just say you're too embarrassed to, to really answer and it's below that. <laughs> okay, yeah, then maybe this upends some of the only, only 9% of you thought that, you know, packaging, uh, container pooling things was, was, was relevant, but more than a third of you obviously have a very poor utilization, so there's something, something wrong there, too. I believe this is our last question, uh, and it's from Sovereign. What is your biggest concern when investing in logistics IT? Is it justifying the business case? Is it getting stakeholder buy-in for change? Is it overall time required for the project? Is it available internal resources for implementation? Or is it no, concern, or not, no real concern though that it's not a priority at the moment? So it's getting the stakeholder buy-in for change, perhaps unsurprisingly. That's, that's the big challenge here. It's getting everyone to agree that we need to change, which is not a bad place to end this discussion as we've been talking about the changes we may need to recognize or confront. Oh, sorry, there's one more question. Sorry about that. That's a question from, from DSV. Uh, multiple contact points with your LSP mean, uh, often create confusion or inefficiency. Uh, it occasionally creates confusion and inefficiency. Uh, allows me to talk to, to specialists, uh, or fact of life, or lead me to change my service provider. So basically, when you have multiple contact points with LSP, what, what impact is it having for you? Often creates confusion or inefficiency is the, the leading response. So typically people want a, a one point of contact or at least a consolidated or central place to go to, to deal with their problems. So that's an interesting, uh, an interesting result there. That really is the last question. Sorry that I tried to cut it off. Obviously, I'm also looking forward to the cocktail now. Um, but before we break, again, thanks very much to, to our panel. I think everyone gave really interesting presentations. <laughs> Maybe you should also go investing in 3D printing. Although if you ask me, the first thing I do if I buy the 3D printer is I have it print more 3D printers. So I don't see why that industry should, uh, should do so well either. So uh, we'll uh, hear maybe more of that, that tonight. We'll have the, head of, the ex head of design again at, at BMW. So let's please enjoy, join us for the gala dinner and I'll see you there. See you back here tomorrow morning as well.